thrived in that role until I didn't thrive in that role. Okay. I did burn out in that job because it was so, so full on. Right. Um, and I know that sort of burnout phrase is a very sort of throwaway phrase nowadays. And it can mean different things from mm. what I can gather. But like I can now recognize that that was proper burnout. Um, I thought I had flu actually. And uh, my yeah. doctor told me it's not flu. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny we had a very similar com conversation again with, with, with Ian who had exactly the same experience, mm. working really hard in something he loved and then just peeling over. Yep. Um, but you don't recognise it at the time, do you? No. You think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm loving this, I'm, I'm doing really well, and then it just... It's such a trick because it's the thing that you enjoy and that you love. And again, mm. like you were saying before, if you're a fashion designer in New York City, what more could you want? Mm. You know, yes, all of those things are true, but at the same time, you're working long hours, you're working very hard. You know, I had my own personal ambition that was driving me on probably more than any employer ever drove me, quite mm. honestly. So some of that was self-inflicted, I think. But um, yeah, it it was a real sort of uh, turning point for me in terms of how I knew that I wanted to then go on. And it once I had that sort of burnout episode, I knew that I had to leave that job. I knew mm. I couldn't stay in it. So it was the, the job. And yeah, more. it was. Yeah. I, I couldn't have stayed there any longer. And I think in that particular role, I'd not seen anybody stay in that role for a very long time after sort mm. of maybe two or three years. It was very, a very high ask with all the travel, I think mostly yeah. um, more than anything. And so I wanted to set up as a freelancer at that point. And I thought I had enough under my belt at that point to set up as a, a trend forecasting freelancer. Or if I needed to, I had the fashion design element yeah. as well. Um, so that's that's what I did. Um, and I combined that with moving back to the northeast. I thought it was time to step out of London. Um, I'd only ever been I'd only ever been in London for the job anyway, and I'd it yeah. had come to a point where I wanted to move back to the northeast. So yeah. I decided to kind of try and bring my chosen profession back to the northeast with me because surprise, there were no trend forecasting companies in the northeast that I could phone up and get a job from. I was gonna say, I mean Newcastle isn't Milan, is it? I mean, it's... It's wonderful, it's but it's not It's getting closer, <laughs> but then it probably wasn't. Yeah, I think, um, you know, and I, a lot of my peers at the time said they thought that my network was in London and that the industry was in London and that I was just going to make it extremely hard for myself to move out of the area and to move back to Newcastle. And that, they were right. It was harder. Um, but... I have now got a team of 21 people, mm -hmm. half of whom are trend forecasters based in the Northeast. And had I not made that decision to move back as a freelancer and then choose to mm -hmm. build from one person into two and two people into five and into 10, then we wouldn't have, you know, I, I classify, yes, we're just one business in the Northeast and we're small, but actually we've created a footprint for an industry that would not exist here yeah. were it not for us. Yeah. So I'm massively protective about that mm. it's like a, it's a massive deal to me that I mm. had to leave the country in the area to go and pursue a career that I couldn't do here but now I can provide jobs for graduates that can come out of the local universities or not from university you know maybe from college or yeah. even from school that can see that this is a legitimate career option for them in this place yes yeah, yeah. so that was what the early 2000s or so was that? that would have been 2005 when I moved back to um the northeast right because it always calls you back Yes, yeah. I was really happy to move back. So happy to move back. It, it always felt like home and I'd never lived in Newcastle before because I'd lived in rural Northumberland in a field. Mm. Um, so for me, it was just really appealing to get to spend that time to get to know the city and be in the city. I'd never mm. really had that. So it felt really exciting in that respect. Mm. I loved it. And a lot of my friends had either gravitated back to the Northeast or some of them hadn't left. So it was right. a lovely sort of ready-made nice friendship and family network to move back to, which uh, eased the pain of trying to set up as a freelancer, um, which was very challenging. Mm. So it was just you in a little office or um, Spare bedroom, or... <laughs> spare bedroom, yeah. And, um, Where all the best businesses start. Yeah, exactly. And I didn't make enough money to, to from that alone. I, I then got a job at what was Cleveland College of Art and Design, which is now the Northern School mm -hmm. of Art, teaching there two days a week um, because I needed to make ends meet. So right. I taught there two days a week and then the rest of my time, the remaining five days of the week, I was trying to to find a way to build from freelancer into not necessarily a company, but I wanted to publish my own trend forecasts. And that's what was happening in the industry. People were publishing trend forecasts as a physical product and shipping hence, them out around the world. Hence Trend Bible. Hence Trend Bible, yeah. I wanted to create a Trend Bible um, and, and ship that out. So 
yeah, that again, a heavy dose of naivety helped me start to pursue that dream. I had no idea what I was letting myself in for and how difficult that was going to be. Because I mean, for one person to to do that, as well as bringing in work and finding clients and... It's insane. You really had no idea what you were doing. <laughs> I had no idea, no idea at all. And I, I was pretty sure that I could, I knew I could forecast trends. So that was the easy bit for me. I was pretty sure I could pull it. I'd been pulling it, pulling it into physical documents in my previous job. So I knew that I had some of those sort of publishing skills. I didn't know anything about sales. I didn't know anything about marketing. I didn't know anything about accounts, being solvent. I didn't know any mm. of that stuff. So I had to sort of learn all of the, the business elements as well as just, you know, the hardest bit was the sales and marketing, trying to produce something and get it out into the world. Um, the first forecast I produced, I had to get 50 copies printed because the printers wouldn't let me produce any less than that. Um, and they arrived in these boxes in my flat and I didn't even have room to store them. They stayed, they lived up the stairs. Um, and I thought, oh, I've spent all this time creating this product and I don't know how to sell it. I don't know how to, what to do with it now. Um, so I did actually sell two out of the 50, right. which most people I knew saw that as a catastrophic failure. And I saw that as an absolute <laughs> success. 